U.S. History, an OpenStax textbook. Read along with the full text at www.openstax.org. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Chapter 2 Early Globalization, the Atlantic World, 1492-1650 Introduction The story of the Atlantic world is the story of global migration, a migration driven in large part by the actions and aspirations of the ruling heads of Europe. Columbus is hardly visible in this illustration of his ships, making landfall on the Caribbean island of Hispaniola. Instead, Ferdinand II of Spain, in the foreground, sits on his throne and points toward Columbus's landing. As the ships arrive, the Arawak people tower over the Spanish, suggesting the native population density of the islands. This historic moment in 1492 sparked new rivalries among European powers as they scrambled to create New World colonies, fueled by the quest for wealth and power, as well as by religious passions. Almost continuous war resulted. Spain achieved early preeminence, creating a far-flung empire and growing rich with treasures from the Americas. Native Americans who confronted the newcomers from Europe suffered unprecedented losses of life, however, as previously unknown diseases sliced through their populations. They also were victims of the arrogance of the Europeans, who viewed themselves as uncontested masters of the New World, sent by God to bring Christianity to the Indians. Two point one Portuguese Exploration and Spanish Conquest Learning Objectives By the end of this section you will be able to describe Portuguese exploration of the Atlantic and Spanish exploration of the Americas and the importance of these voyages to the developing Atlantic world. Explain the importance of Spanish exploration of the Americas in the expansion of Spain's empire and the development of Spanish Renaissance culture. Portuguese colonization of Atlantic islands in the 1400s inaugurated an era of aggressive European expansion across the Atlantic. In the 1500s, Spain surpassed Portugal as the dominant European power. This age of exploration and the subsequent creation of an Atlantic world marked the earliest phase of globalization, in which previously isolated groups, Africans, Native Americans, and Europeans, first came into contact with each other, sometimes with disastrous results. Portuguese Exploration Portugal's Prince Henry the Navigator spearheaded his country's exploration of Africa and the Atlantic in the 1400s. With his support, Portuguese mariners successfully navigated an eastward route to Africa, establishing a foothold there that became a foundation of their nation's trade empire in the 15th and 16th centuries. Portuguese mariners built an Atlantic empire by colonizing the Canary, Cape Verde, and Azores Islands, as well as the island of Madeira. Merchants then used these Atlantic outposts as debarkation points for subsequent journeys. From these strategic points, Portugal spread its empire down the western coast of Africa to the Congo, along the western coast of India, and eventually to Brazil on the eastern coast of South America. It also established trading posts in China and Japan. While the Portuguese didn't rule over an immense landmass, their strategic holdings of islands and coastal ports gave them almost unrivaled control of nautical trade routes and a global empire of trading posts during the 1400s. The travels of Portuguese traders to Western Africa introduced them to the African slave trade already brisk among African states. Seeing the value of this source of labor in growing the profitable crop of sugar on their Atlantic islands, the Portuguese soon began exporting enslaved Africans along with African ivory and gold. Sugar fueled the Atlantic slave trade and the Portuguese islands quickly became home to sugar plantations. 
The Portuguese also traded these enslaved people, introducing much-needed human capital to other European nations. In the following years, as European exploration spread, slavery spread as well. In time, much of the Atlantic world would become a gargantuan sugar plantation complex in which Africans labored to produce the highly profitable commodity for European consumers. Americana, Elmina Castle. In 1482, Portuguese traders built Elmina Castle, also called São Jorge de Mina or St. George's of the Mine, in present-day Ghana, on the west coast of Africa. A fortified trading post, it had mounted cannons facing out to sea, not inland toward continental Africa. The Portuguese had greater fear of a naval attack from other Europeans than of a land attack from Africans. Portuguese traders soon began to settle around the fort and establish the town of Elmina. Although the Portuguese originally used the fort primarily for trading gold, by the 16th century they had shifted their focus. The dungeon of the fort now served as a holding pen for enslaved Africans from the interior of the continent, while on the upper floors Portuguese traders ate, slept, and prayed in a chapel. Enslaved people lived in the dungeon for weeks or months until ships arrived to transport them to Europe or the Americas. For them, the dungeon of Elmina was their last sight of their home country. Spanish Exploration and Conquest The Spanish established the first European settlements in the Americas, beginning in the Caribbean and, by 1600, extending throughout Central and South America. Thousands of Spaniards flocked to the Americas, seeking wealth and status. The most famous of these Spanish adventurers are Christopher Columbus, who, though Italian himself, explored on behalf of the Spanish monarchs, Hernán Cortés and Francisco Pizarro. The history of Spanish exploration begins with the history of Spain itself. During the 15th century, Spain hoped to gain advantage over its rival, Portugal. The marriage of Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile in 1469 unified Catholic Spain and began the process of building a nation that could compete for worldwide power. Since the 700s, much of Spain had been under Islamic rule, and King Ferdinand II and Queen Isabella I, arch defenders of the Catholic Church against Islam, were determined to defeat the Muslims in Granada, the last Islamic stronghold in Spain. In 1492, they completed the Reconquista, the centuries-long Christian conquest of the Iberian Peninsula. The Reconquista marked another step forward in the process of making Spain an imperial power, and Ferdinand and Isabella were now ready to look further afield. Their goals were to expand Catholicism and to gain a commercial advantage over Portugal. To those ends, Ferdinand and Isabella sponsored extensive Atlantic exploration. Spain's most famous explorer, Christopher Columbus, was actually from Genoa, Italy. He believed that, using calculations based on other mariners' journeys, he could chart a westward route to India, which could be used to expand European trade and spread Christianity. Starting in 1485, he approached Genoese, Venetian, Portuguese, English, and Spanish monarchs, asking for ships and funding to explore this westward route. All those he petitioned, including Ferdinand and Isabella at first, rebuffed him. Their nautical experts all concurred that Columbus's estimates of the width of the Atlantic Ocean were far too low. However, after three years of entreaties, and more important, the completion of the Reconquista, Ferdinand and Isabella agreed to finance Columbus's expedition in 1492, supplying him with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. The Spanish monarchs knew that Portuguese mariners had reached the southern tip of Africa and sailed the Indian Ocean. They understood that the Portuguese would soon reach Asia, and, in this competitive race to reach the Far East, the Spanish rulers decided to act. Columbus held erroneous views that shaped his thinking about what he would encounter as he sailed west. He believed the Earth to be much smaller than its actual size, and, since he did not know of the existence of the Americas, he fully expected to land in Asia. On October 12, 1492, however, he made landfall on an island in the Bahamas. 
He then sailed to an island he named Hispaniola, present-day Dominican Republic in Haiti. Believing he had landed in the East Indies, Columbus called the native Tainos he found there Indios, giving rise to the term Indian for any native people of the New World. Upon Columbus's return to Spain, the Spanish crown bestowed on him the title of Admiral of the Ocean Sea and named him Governor and Viceroy of the lands he had discovered. As a devoted Catholic, Columbus had agreed with Ferdinand and Isabella prior to sailing west that part of the expected wealth from his voyage would be used to continue the fight against Islam. Columbus's 1493 letter, or Probanza de Merito, Proof of Merit, describing his discovery of a new world, did much to inspire excitement in Europe. Probanzas de Meritos were reports and letters written by Spaniards in the New World to the Spanish crown, designed to win royal patronage. Today, they highlight the difficult task of historical work. While the letters are primary sources, historians need to understand the context and the culture in which the conquistadors, as the Spanish adventurers came to be called, wrote them and distinguish their bias and subjective nature. While they are filled with distortions and fabrications, Probanzas de Meritos are still useful in illustrating the expectation of wealth among the explorers, as well as their view that native peoples would not pose a serious obstacle to colonization. In 1493, Columbus sent two copies of a Probanza de Merito to the Spanish king and queen and their minister of finance, Luis de Santangel. Santangel had supported Columbus's voyage, helping him to obtain funding from Ferdinand and Isabella. Copies of the letter were soon circulating all over Europe, spreading news of the wondrous new land that Columbus had discovered. Columbus would make three more voyages over the next decade, establishing Spain's first settlement in the New World on the island of Hispaniola. Many other Europeans followed in Columbus's footsteps, drawn by dreams of winning wealth by sailing west. Another Italian, Amerigo Vespucci, sailing for the Portuguese crown, explored the South American coastline between 1499 and 1502. Unlike Columbus, he realized that the Americas were not part of Asia, but lands unknown to Europeans. Vespucci's widely published accounts of his voyages fueled speculation and intense interest in the New World among Europeans. Among those who read Vespucci's reports was the German mapmaker Martin Waldse Muller. Using the explorer's first name as a label for the new landmass, Waldse Muller attached America to his map of the New World in 1507, and the name stuck. The 1492 Columbus landfall accelerated the rivalry between Spain and Portugal, and the two powers vied for domination through the acquisition of new lands. In the 1480s, Pope Sixtus IV had granted Portugal the right to all land south of the Cape Verde Islands, leading the Portuguese king to claim that the lands discovered by Columbus belonged to Portugal, not Spain. Seeking to ensure that Columbus's finds would remain Spanish, Spain's monarchs turned to the Spanish-born Pope Alexander VI, who issued two papal decrees in 1493 that gave legitimacy to Spain's Atlantic claims at the expense of Portugal. Hoping to salvage Portugal's Atlantic holdings, King Juan II began negotiations with Spain. The resulting Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494 drew a north-to-south line through South America. Spain gained territory west of the line, while Portugal retained the lands east of the line, including the east coast of Brazil. Columbus's discovery opened a floodgate of Spanish exploration. Inspired by tales of rivers of gold and timid, malleable natives, later Spanish explorers were relentless in their quest for land and gold. Hernán Cortés hoped to gain hereditary privilege for his family, tribute payments and labor from natives, and an annual pension for his service to the crown. Cortés arrived on Hispaniola in 1504 and took part in the conquest of that island.
In anticipation of winning his own honor and riches, Cortes later explored the Yucatan Peninsula. In 1519, he entered Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec, Mexica Empire. He and his men were astonished by the incredibly sophisticated causeways, gardens, and temples in the city, but they were horrified by the practice of human sacrifice that was part of the Aztec religion. Above all else, the Aztec wealth in gold fascinated the Spanish adventurers. Hoping to gain power over the city, Cortes took Moctezuma, the Aztec ruler, hostage. The Spanish then murdered hundreds of high-ranking Mexica during a festival to celebrate Huitzilopochtli, the god of war. This angered the people of Tenochtitlan, who rose up against the interlopers in their city. Cortes and his people fled for their lives, running down one of Tenochtitlan's causeways to safety on the shore. Smarting from their defeat at the hands of the Aztec, Cortes slowly created alliances with native peoples who resented Aztec rule. It took nearly a year for the Spanish and the tens of thousands of native allies who joined them to defeat the Mexica in Tenochtitlan, which they did by laying siege to the city. Only by playing upon the disunity among the diverse groups in the Aztec Empire were the Spanish able to capture the grand city of Tenochtitlan. In August 1521, having successfully fomented civil war as well as fended off rival Spanish explorers, Cortes claimed Tenochtitlan for Spain and renamed it Mexico City. The traditional European narrative of exploration presents the victory of the Spanish over the Aztec as an example of the superiority of the Europeans over the savage Indians. However, the reality is far more complex. When Cortes explored central Mexico, he encountered a region simmering with conflict. Far from being unified and content under Aztec rule, many peoples in Mexico resented it and were ready to rebel. One group in particular, the Tlaxcalan, threw their lot in with the Spanish, providing as many as 200,000 fighters in the siege of Tenochtitlan. The Spanish also brought smallpox into the Valley of Mexico. The disease took a heavy toll on the people in Tenochtitlan, playing a much greater role in the city's demise than did Spanish force of arms. Cortes was also aided by a Nahua woman called Malintzin, also known as La Malinche or Doña Marina, her Spanish name, whom the natives of Tabasco gave him as tribute. Malintzin translated for Cortes in his dealings with Moctezuma and whether willingly or under pressure, entered into a physical relationship with him. Their son, Martin, may have been the first mestizo, person of mixed indigenous American and European descent. Malinson remains a controversial figure in the history of the Atlantic world. Some people view her as a traitor because she helped Corte conquer the Aztecs, while others see her as a victim of European expansion. In either case, she demonstrates one way in which native peoples responded to the arrival of the Spanish. Without her, Cortes would not have been able to communicate, and without the language bridge, he surely would have been less successful in destabilizing the Aztec Empire. By this and other means, native people helped shape the conquest of the Americas. Spain's acquisitiveness seemingly knew no bounds as groups of its explorers searched for the next trove of instant riches. One such explorer, Francisco Pizarro, made his way to the Spanish Caribbean in 1509, drawn by the promise of wealth and titles. He participated in successful expeditions in Panama before following rumors of Inca wealth to the south. Although his first efforts against the Inca Empire in the 1520s failed, Pizarro captured the Inca Emperor Atahualpa in 1532, and executed him one year later. In 1533, Pizarro founded Lima, Peru. Like Cortes, Pizarro had to combat not only the natives of the new worlds he was conquering, but also competitors from his own country. A Spanish rival assassinated him in 1541. Spain's drive to enlarge its empire led other hopeful conquistadors to push further into the Americas, 
hoping to replicate the success of Cortés and Pizarro. Hernando de Soto had participated in Pizarro's conquest of the Inca, and from 1539 to 1542, he led expeditions to what is today the southeastern United States, looking for gold. He and his followers explored what is now Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Texas. Everywhere they traveled, they brought European diseases, which claimed thousands of native lives as well as the lives of the explorers. In 1542, De Soto himself died during the expedition. The surviving Spaniards, numbering a little over 300, returned to Mexico City without finding the much-anticipated mountains of gold and silver. Francisco Vasquez de Coronado was born into a noble family and went to Mexico, then called New Spain, in 1535. He presided as governor over the province of Nueva Galicia, where he heard rumors of wealth to the north, a golden city called Quivira. Between 1540 and 1542, Coronado led a large expedition of Spaniards and native allies to the lands north of Mexico City. And for the next several years, they explored the area that is now the southwestern United States. During the winter of 1540 to 41, the explorers waged war against the Tiwa in present-day New Mexico. Rather than leading to the discovery of gold and silver, however, the expedition simply left Coronado bankrupt. Defining American Columbus's Probanza de Merito of 1493 The exploits of the most famous Spanish explorers have provided Western civilization with a narrative of European supremacy and Native American savagery. However, these stories are based on the self-aggrandizing efforts of conquistadors to secure royal favor through the writing of Probanzas de Méritos, Proofs of Merit. Below are excerpts from Columbus's 1493 letter to Luis de Santangel, which illustrates how fantastic reports from European explorers gave rise to many myths surrounding the Spanish conquest and the New World. This island, like all the others, is most extensive. It has many ports along the sea coast, excelling any in Christendom, and many fine, large, flowing rivers. The land there is elevated, with many mountains and peaks incomparably higher than in the center isle. They are most beautiful, of a thousand varied forms, accessible and full of trees of endless varieties, so high that they seem to touch the sky, and I have been told that they never lose their foliage. There is honey, and there are many kinds of birds and a great variety of fruits. Inland, there are numerous mines of metals and innumerable people. Hispaniola is a marvel. Its hills and mountains, fine plains and open country are rich and fertile for planting and for pasturage and for building towns and villages. The seaports there are incredibly fine, as also the magnificent rivers, most of which bear gold. The trees, fruits and grasses differ widely from those in Juana. There are many spices and vast mines of gold and other metals in this island. They have no iron, nor steel, nor weapons, nor are they fit for them, because although they are well-made men of commanding stature, they appear extraordinarily timid. The only arms they have are sticks of cane, cut when in seed, with a sharpened stick at the end, and they are afraid to use these. Often I have sent two or three men ashore to some town to converse with them, and the natives came out in great numbers, and as soon as they saw our men arrive, fled without a moment's delay, although I protected them from all injury. What does this letter show us about Spanish objectives in the New World? How do you think it might have influenced Europeans reading about the New World for the first time? The Spanish Golden Age. The exploits of European explorers had a profound impact both in the Americas and back in Europe. An exchange of ideas, fueled and financed in part by New World commodities, began to connect European nations and, in turn, to touch the parts of the world that Europeans conquered. In Spain, gold and silver from the Americas helped to fuel a golden age, the Siglo de Oro, when Spanish art and literature flourished. Riches poured in from the colonies 
and new ideas poured in from other countries and new lands. The Habsburg dynasty, which ruled a collection of territories including Austria, the Netherlands, Naples, Sicily, and Spain, encouraged and financed the work of painters, sculptors, musicians, architects, and writers, resulting in a blooming of Spanish Renaissance culture. One of this period's most famous works is the novel The Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes. This two-volume book, published in 1605 and 1618, told a colorful tale of an Hidalgo, gentleman, who reads so many tales of chivalry and knighthood that he becomes unable to tell reality from fiction. With his faithful sidekick, Sancho Panza, Don Quixote leaves reality behind and sets out to revive chivalry by doing battle with what he perceives as the enemies of Spain. Spain attracted innovative foreign painters, such as El Greco, a Greek who had studied with Italian Renaissance masters like Titian and Michelangelo before moving to Toledo. Native Spaniards created equally enduring works. Las Meninas, the Maids of Honor, painted by Diego Velázquez in 1656, is one of the best-known paintings in history. Velázquez painted himself into this imposingly large royal portrait. He's shown holding his brush and easel on the left, and boldly placed the viewer where the king and queen would stand in the scene. Two point two, religious upheavals in the developing Atlantic world. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to explain the changes brought by the Protestant Reformation and how it influenced the development of the Atlantic world. Describe Spain's response to the Protestant Reformation. Until the 1500s, the Catholic Church provided a unifying religious structure for Christian Europe. The Vatican in Rome exercised great power over the lives of Europeans. It controlled not only learning and scholarship, but also finances, because it levied taxes on the faithful. Spain, with its new world wealth, was the bastion of the Catholic faith. Beginning with the reform efforts of Martin Luther in 1517, and John Calvin in the 1530s, however, Catholic dominance came under attack as the Protestant Reformation, a split or schism among European Christians, began. During the 16th century, Protestantism spread through Northern Europe, and Catholic countries responded by attempting to extinguish what was seen as the Protestant menace. Religious turmoil between Catholics and Protestants influenced the history of the Atlantic world as well since different nation-states competed not only for control of new territories, but also for the preeminence of their religious beliefs there. Just as the history of Spain's rise to power is linked to the Reconquista, so too is the history of early globalization connected to the history of competing Christian groups in the Atlantic world. Martin Luther Martin Luther was a German Catholic monk, who took issue with the Catholic Church's practice of selling indulgences, documents that absolved sinners of their errant behavior. He also objected to the Catholic Church's taxation of ordinary Germans and the delivery of Mass in Latin, arguing that it failed to instruct German Catholics who did not understand the language. Many Europeans had called for reforms of the Catholic Church before Martin Luther did, but his protest had the unintended consequence of splitting European Christianity. Luther compiled a list of what he viewed as needed church reforms, a document that came to be known as the 95 Theses, and nailed it to the door of a church in Wittenberg, Germany, in 1517. He called for the publication of the Bible in everyday language, took issue with the church's policy of imposing tithes, a required payment to the church that appeared to enrich the clergy, and denounced the buying and selling of indulgences. Although he had hoped to reform the Catholic Church while remaining a part of it, Luther's action instead triggered a movement called the Protestant Reformation that divided the church in two. The Catholic Church condemned him as a heretic, but a doctrine based on his reforms, called Lutheranism, spread through northern Germany and Scandinavia. John Calvin, like Luther, 
the French lawyer John Calvin advocated making the Bible accessible to ordinary people. Only by reading Scripture and reflecting daily about their spiritual condition, he argued, could believers begin to understand the power of God. In 1535, Calvin fled Catholic France and led the Reformation movement from Geneva, Switzerland. Calvinism emphasized human powerlessness before an omniscient God and stressed the idea of predestination, the belief that God selected a few chosen people for salvation while everyone else was predestined to damnation. Calvinists believed that reading Scripture prepared sinners, if they were among the elect, to receive God's grace. In Geneva, Calvin established a Bible commonwealth, a community of believers whose sole source of authority was their interpretation of the Bible, not the authority of any prince or monarch. Soon, Calvin's ideas spread to the Netherlands and Scotland. Protestantism in England Protestantism spread beyond the German states and Geneva to England, which had been a Catholic nation for centuries. Luther's idea that Scripture should be available in the everyday language of worshipers inspired English scholar William Tyndale to translate the Bible into English in 1526. The seismic break with the Catholic Church in England occurred in the 1530s, when Henry VIII established a new Protestant state religion. A devout Catholic, Henry had initially stood in opposition to the Reformation. Pope Leo X even awarded him the title Defender of the Faith. The tides turned, however, when Henry desired a male heir to the Tudor monarchy. When his Spanish Catholic wife, Catherine, the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, did not give birth to a boy, the king sought an annulment to their marriage. When the Pope refused his request, Henry created a new national Protestant church, the Church of England, with himself at its head. This left him free to annul his own marriage and marry Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn also failed to produce a male heir, and when she was accused of adultery, Henry had her executed. His third wife, Jane Seymour, at long last delivered a son, Edward, who ruled for only a short time before dying in 1553 at the age of 15. Mary, the daughter of Henry VIII and his discarded first wife Catherine, then came to the throne, committed to restoring Catholicism. She earned the nickname Bloody Mary for the many executions of Protestants, often by burning alive, that she ordered during her reign. Religious turbulence in England was finally quieted when Elizabeth, the Protestant daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, ascended the throne in 1558. Under Elizabeth, the Church of England again became the state church, retaining the hierarchical structure and many of the rituals of the Catholic Church. However, by the late 1500s, some English members of the church began to agitate for more reform. Known as Puritans, they worked to erase all vestiges of Catholicism from the Church of England. At the time, the term Puritan was a pejorative one. Many people saw Puritans as holier-than-thou frauds who used religion to swindle their neighbors. Worse still, many in power saw Puritans as a security threat because of their opposition to the national church. Under Elizabeth, whose long reign lasted from 1558 to 1603, Puritans grew steadily in number. After James I died in 1625 and his son Charles I ascended the throne, Puritans became the target of increasing state pressure to conform. Many crossed the Atlantic in the 1620s and 1630s instead to create a New England a haven for Reformed Protestantism, where Puritan was no longer a term of abuse. Thus, the religious upheavals that affected England so much had equally momentous consequences for the Americas. Religious War By the early 1500s, the Protestant Reformation threatened the massive Spanish Catholic Empire. As the preeminent Catholic power, Spain would not tolerate any challenge to the Holy Catholic Church. Over the course of the 1500s, it devoted vast amounts of treasure and labor 
to leading an unsuccessful effort to eradicate Protestantism in Europe. Spain's main enemies at this time were the runaway Spanish provinces of the North Netherlands. By 1581, these seven northern provinces had declared their independence from Spain and created the Dutch Republic, also called Holland, where Protestantism was tolerated. Determined to deal a death blow to Protestantism in England and Holland, King Philip of Spain assembled a massive force of over 30,000 men and 130 ships, and in 1588 he sent this navy, the Spanish Armada, north. But English sea power combined with a maritime storm destroyed the fleet. The defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 was but one part of a larger but undeclared war between Protestant England and Catholic Spain. Between 1585 and 1604, the two rivals sparred repeatedly. England launched its own armada in 1589 in an effort to disable the Spanish fleet and capture Spanish treasure. However, the foray ended in disaster for the English, with storms, disease, and the strength of the Spanish armada combining to bring about defeat. The conflict between Spain and England dragged on into the early 17th century, and the newly Protestant nations, especially England and the Dutch Republic, posed a significant challenge to Spain and also to Catholic France as imperial rivalries played out in the Atlantic world. Spain retained its mighty American empire, but by the early 1600s, the nation could no longer keep England and other European rivals, the French and Dutch, from colonizing smaller islands in the Caribbean. Religious intolerance characterized the 16th and 17th centuries, an age of powerful state religions with the authority to impose and enforce belief systems on the population. In this climate, religious violence was common. One of the most striking examples is the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572, in which French Catholic troops began to kill unarmed French Protestants. The murders touched off mob violence that ultimately claimed 9,000 lives, a bloody episode that highlights the degree of religious turmoil that gripped Europe in the aftermath of the Protestant Reformation. Two point three Challenges to Spain's Supremacy Learning Objectives By the end of this section you will be able to identify regions where the English, French, and Dutch explored and established settlements, describe the differences among the early colonies, explain the role of the American colonies in European nations' struggles for domination. For Europeans, the discovery of an Atlantic world meant newfound wealth in the form of gold and silver, as well as valuable furs. The Americas also provided a new arena for intense imperial rivalry as different European nations jockeyed for preeminence in the New World. The religious motives for colonization spurred European expansion as well, and as the Protestant Reformation gained ground beginning in the 1520s, rivalries between Catholic and Protestant Christians spilled over into the Americas. English Exploration Disruptions during the Tudor monarchy, especially the creation of the Protestant Church of England by Henry VIII in the 1530s, the return of the nation to Catholicism under Queen Mary in the 1550s, and the restoration of Protestantism under Queen Elizabeth, left England with little energy for overseas projects. More important, England lacked the financial resources for such endeavors. Nonetheless, English monarchs carefully monitored developments in the New Atlantic world and took steps to assert England's claim to the Americas. As early as 1497, Henry VIII of England had commissioned John Cabot, an Italian mariner, to explore new lands. Cabot sailed from England that year and made landfall somewhere along the North American coastline. For the next century, English fishermen routinely crossed the Atlantic to fish the rich waters off the North American coast. However, English colonization efforts in the 1500s were closer to home, as England devoted its energy to the colonization of Ireland. 
Queen Elizabeth favored England's advance into the Atlantic world, though her main concern was blocking Spain's effort to eliminate Protestantism. Indeed, England could not commit to large-scale colonization in the Americas as long as Spain appeared ready to invade Ireland or Scotland. Nonetheless, Elizabeth approved of English privateers, sea captains to whom the home government had given permission to raid the enemy at will. These skilled mariners cruised the Caribbean, plundering Spanish ships whenever they could. Each year, the English took more than 100,000 pounds from Spain in this way. English privateer Francis Drake first made a name for himself when, in 1573, he looted silver, gold, and pearls worth 40,000 pounds. Elizabeth did sanction an early attempt at colonization in 1584 when Sir Walter Raleigh, a favorite of the Queen's, attempted to establish a colony at Roanoke, an island off the coast of present-day North Carolina. The colony was small, consisting of only 117 people who suffered a poor relationship with the local Croatans and struggled to survive in their new land. Their governor, John White, returned to England in late 1587 to secure more people and supplies. But events conspired to keep him away from Roanoke for three years. By the time he returned in 1590, the entire colony had vanished. The only trace the colonists left behind was the word Croatoan carved into a fence surrounding the village. Governor White never knew whether the colonists had decamped for nearby Croatoan Island, now Hatteras, or whether some disaster had befallen them all. Roanoke is still called the Lost Colony. English promoters of colonization pushed its commercial advantages and the religious justification that English colonies would allow the establishment of Protestantism in the Americas. Both arguments struck a chord. In the early 1600s, wealthy English merchants and the landed elite began to pool their resources to form joint stock companies. In this novel business arrangement, which was in many ways the precursor to the modern corporation, investors provided the capital for and assumed the risk of a venture in order to reap significant returns. The companies gained the approval of the English crown to establish colonies and their investors dreamed of reaping great profits from the money they put into overseas colonization. The first permanent English settlement was established by a joint stock company, the Virginia Company. Named for Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen, the company gained royal approval to establish a colony on the east coast of North America, and in 1606, it sent 144 men and boys to the New World. In early 1607, this group sailed up Chesapeake Bay, finding a river they called the James in honor of their new king, James I. They established a ramshackle settlement and named it Jamestown. Despite serious struggles, the colony survived. Many of Jamestown's settlers were desperate men. Although they came from elite families, they were younger sons who would not inherit their father's estates. The Jamestown adventurers believed they would find instant wealth in the New World and did not actually expect to have to perform work. George Percy, born in England to the 8th Earl of Northumberland, was among them. His account, excerpted below, illustrates the hardships the English confronted in Virginia in 1607. By any measure, England came late to the race to colonize. As Jamestown limped along in the 1610s, the Spanish Empire extended around the globe and grew rich from its global colonial project. Yet the English persisted, and for this reason the Jamestown settlement has a special place in history as the first permanent English colony in what later became the United States. After Jamestown's founding, English colonization of the New World accelerated. In 1609, a ship bound for Jamestown foundered in a storm and landed on Bermuda. Some believe this incident helped inspire Shakespeare's 1611 play, The Tempest. The admiral of the ship, George Summers, claimed the island for the English crown. The English also began to colonize small islands in the Caribbean, 
an incursion into the Spanish-American Empire. They established themselves on small islands such as St. Christopher in 1624, Barbados in 1627, Nevis in 1628, Montserrat and Antigua, both in, in 1632. From the start, the English West Indies had a commercial orientation, for these islands produced cash crops, first tobacco, and then sugar. Very quickly, by the mid-1600s, Barbados had become one of the most important English colonies because of the sugar produced there. Barbados was the first English colony dependent on enslaved people, and it became a model for other English slave societies on the American mainland. These differed radically from England itself, where slavery was not practiced. English Puritans also began to colonize the Americas in the 1620s and 1630s. These intensely religious migrants dreamed of creating communities of reformed Protestantism where the corruption of England would be eliminated. One of the first groups of Puritans to move to North America, known as Pilgrims and led by William Bradford, had originally left England to live in the Netherlands. Fearing their children were losing their English identity among the Dutch, however, they sailed for North America in 1620 to settle at Plymouth, the first English settlement in New England. The Pilgrims differed from other Puritans in their insistence on separating from what they saw as the corrupt Church of England. For this reason, Pilgrims are known as Separatists. Like Jamestown, Plymouth occupies an iconic place in American national memory. The tale of the 102 migrants who crossed the Atlantic aboard the Mayflower and their struggle for survival is a well-known narrative of the founding of the country. Their story includes the signing of the Mayflower Compact, a written agreement whereby the English voluntarily agreed to help each other. Some interpret this 1620 document as an expression of democratic spirit because of the cooperative and inclusive nature of the agreement to live and work together. In 1630, a much larger contingent of Puritans left England to escape conformity to the Church of England and founded the Massachusetts Bay Colony. In the following years, thousands more arrived to create a new life in the rocky soils and cold climates of New England. In comparison to Catholic Spain, however, Protestant England remained a very weak imperial player in the early 17th century, with only a few infant colonies in the Americas in the early 1600s. The English never found treasure equal to that of the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan, and England did not quickly grow rich from its small American outposts. The English colonies also differed from each other. Barbados and Virginia had a decidedly commercial orientation from the start, while the Puritan colonies of New England were intensely religious at their inception. All English settlements in America, however, marked the increasingly important role of England in the Atlantic world. My Story George Percy and the First Months at Jamestown The 144 men and boys who started the Jamestown colony faced many hardships. By the end of the first winter, only 38 had survived. Disease, hunger, and poor relationships with local natives all contributed to the colony's high death toll. George Percy, who served twice as governor of Jamestown, kept records of the colonists' first months in the colony. These records were later published in London in 1608. This excerpt is from his account of August and September of 1607. The fourth day of September died Thomas Jacob Sargent. The fifth day there died Benjamin Beast. Our men were destroyed with cruel diseases as swellings, fluxes, burning fevers, and by wars, and some departed suddenly. But for the most part they died of mere famine. There were never Englishmen left in a foreign country in such misery as we were in this new, discovered Virginia. Our food was but a small can of barley soaked in water. To five men a day, our drink cold water taken out of the river, which was at a flood very salty, at a low tide full of slime and filth, which was the destruction of many of our men. Thus we lived for the space of five months in this miserable distress, not having five able men to man our bulwarks upon any occasion. 
If it had not pleased God to have put a terror in the savages' hearts, we had all perished by those wild and cruel pagans, being in that weak estate as we were, our men night and day groaning in every corner of the fort most pitiful to hear. If there were any conscience in men, it would make their hearts to bleed to hear the pitiful murmurings and outcries of our sick men without relief every night and day, for the space of six weeks, some departing out of the world, many times three or four in a night. In the morning their bodies trailed out of their cabins like dogs to be buried. In this sort did I see the mortality of diverse of our people. According to George Percy's account, what were the major problems the Jamestown settlers encountered? What kept the colony from complete destruction? French Exploration Spanish exploits in the New World whetted the appetite of other would-be imperial powers, including France. Like Spain, France was a Catholic nation and committed to expanding Catholicism around the globe. In the early 16th century, it joined the race to explore the New World and exploit the resources of the Western Hemisphere. Navigator Jacques Cartier claimed northern North America for France, naming the area New France. From 1534 to 1541, he made three voyages of discovery on the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the St. Lawrence River. Like other explorers, Cartier made exaggerated claims of mineral wealth in America, but he was unable to send great riches back to France. Due to resistance from the native peoples as well as his own lack of planning, he could not establish a permanent settlement in North America. Explorer Samuel de Champlain occupies a special place in the history of the Atlantic world for his role in establishing the French presence in the New World. Champlain explored the Caribbean in 1601 and then the coast of New England in 1603 before traveling farther north. In 1608, he founded Quebec and he made numerous Atlantic crossings as he worked tirelessly to promote New France. Unlike other imperial powers, France, through Champlain's efforts, fostered especially good relationships with native peoples, paving the way for French exploration further into the continent, around the Great Lakes, around Hudson Bay, and, eventually, to the Mississippi. Champlain made an alliance with the Huron Confederacy and the Algonquins, and agreed to fight with them against their enemy, the Iroquois. The French were primarily interested in establishing commercially viable colonial outposts, and, to that end, they created extensive trading networks in New France. These networks relied on native hunters to harvest furs, especially beaver pelts, and to exchange these items for French glass beads and other trade goods. French fashion at the time favored broad-brimmed hats trimmed in beaver fur, so French traders had a ready market for their North American goods. The French also dreamed of replicating the wealth of Spain by colonizing the tropical zones. After Spanish control of the Caribbean began to weaken, the French turned their attention to small islands in the West Indies, and by 1635 they had colonized two, Guadeloupe and Martinique. Though it lagged far behind Spain, France now boasted its own West Indian colonies. Both islands became lucrative sugar plantation sites that turned a profit for French planters by relying on African slave labor. Dutch colonization Dutch entrance into the Atlantic world is part of the larger story of religious and imperial conflict in the early modern era. In the 1500s, Calvinism, one of the major Protestant reform movements, had found adherents in the northern provinces of the Spanish Netherlands. During the 16th century, these provinces began a long struggle to achieve independence from Catholic Spain. Established in 1581, but not recognized as independent by Spain until 1648, the Dutch Republic, or Holland, quickly made itself a powerful force in the race for Atlantic colonies and wealth. The Dutch distinguished themselves as commercial leaders in the 17th century, and their mode of colonization relied on powerful corporations. The Dutch East India Company, chartered in 1602 to trade in Asia, and the Dutch West India Company, established in 1621 
to colonize and trade in the Americas. While employed by the Dutch East India Company in 1609, the English sea captain Henry Hudson explored New York Harbor and the river that now bears his name. Like many explorers of the time, Hudson was actually seeking a northwest passage to Asia and its wealth. But the ample furs harvested from the region he explored, especially the coveted beaver pelts, provided a reason to claim it for the Netherlands. The Dutch named their colony New Netherlands, and it served as a fur trading outpost for the expanding and powerful Dutch West India Company. With headquarters in New Amsterdam on the island of Manhattan, the Dutch set up several regional trading posts, including one at Fort Orange, named for the Royal Dutch House of Orange Nassau in present-day Albany. The color orange remains significant to the Dutch, having become particularly associated with William of Orange, Protestantism, and the Glorious Revolution of 1688. A brisk trade in furs with local Algonquian and Iroquois peoples brought the Dutch and native peoples together in a commercial network that extended throughout the Hudson River Valley and beyond. The Dutch West India Company, in turn, established colonies on Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, St. Martin, St. Eustatius, and Saba. With their outposts in New Netherlands and the Caribbean, the Dutch had established themselves in the 17th century as a commercially powerful rival to Spain. Amsterdam became a trade hub for all the Atlantic world. Two point four. New Worlds in the Americas. Labor, Commerce, and the Columbian Exchange. Learning Objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to describe how Europeans solved their labor problems, describe the theory of mercantilism and the process of commodification, analyze the effects of the Columbian Exchange. European promoters of colonization claimed the Americas overflowed with a wealth of treasures, burnishing national glory and honor became entwined with carving out colonies, and no nation wanted to be left behind. However, the realities of life in the Americas, violence, exploitation, and particularly the need for workers, were soon driving the practice of slavery and forced labor. Everywhere in America, a stark contrast existed between freedom and slavery. The Columbian Exchange, in which Europeans transported plants, animals and diseases across the Atlantic in both directions also left a lasting impression on the Americas. Labor Systems Physical power to work the fields, build villages, process raw materials, is a necessity for maintaining a society. During the 16th and 17th centuries, humans could derive power only from the wind, water, animals, or other humans. Everywhere in the Americas, a crushing demand for labor bedeviled Europeans because there were not enough colonists to perform the work necessary to keep the colonies going. Spain granted encomiendas, legal rights to native labor, to conquistadors who could prove their service to the crown. This system reflected the Spanish view of colonization. The king rewarded successful conquistadors who expanded the empire. Some native peoples who had sided with the conquistadors, like the Tlaxcalan, also gained encomiendas. Malintzin, the Nahua woman who helped Cortés defeat the Mexica, was granted one. The Spanish believed native peoples would work for them by right of conquest, and, in return, the Spanish would bring them Catholicism. In theory, the relationship consisted of reciprocal obligations, but in practice, the Spaniards ruthlessly exploited it, seeing native people as little more than beasts of burden. Convinced of their right to the land and its peoples, they sought both to control native labor and to impose what they viewed as correct religious beliefs upon the land's inhabitants. Native peoples everywhere resisted both the labor obligations and the effort to change their ancient belief systems. Indeed, many retained their religion or incorporated only the parts of Catholicism that made sense to them. The system of encomiendas was accompanied by a great deal of violence. One Spaniard, 
Bartolomé de las Casas denounced the brutality of Spanish rule. A Dominican friar, Las Casas, had been one of the earliest Spanish settlers in the Spanish West Indies. In his early life in the Americas, he enslaved native people and was the recipient of an encomienda. However, after witnessing the savagery with which encomenderos, recipients of encomiendas, treated the native people, he reversed his views. In 1515, Las Casas released his enslaved natives, gave up his encomienda, and began to advocate for humane treatment of native peoples. He lobbied for new legislation, eventually known as the New Laws, which would eliminate slavery and the encomienda system. Las Casas's writing about the Spaniards' horrific treatment of native people helped inspire the so-called Black Legend, the idea that the Spanish were bloodthirsty conquerors with no regard for human life. Perhaps not surprisingly, those who held this view of the Spanish were Spain's imperial rivals. English writers and others seized on the idea of Spain's ruthlessness to support their own colonization projects. By demonizing the Spanish, they justified their own efforts as more humane. All European colonizers, however, shared a disregard for native peoples. Native peoples were not the only source of cheap labor in the Americas. By the middle of the 16th century, Africans formed an important element of the labor landscape, producing the cash crops of sugar and tobacco for European markets. Europeans viewed Africans as non-Christians, which they used as a justification for enslavement. Denied control over their lives, enslaved people endured horrendous conditions. At every opportunity, they resisted enslavement, and their resistance was met with violence. Indeed, physical, mental, and sexual violence formed a key strategy among European slaveholders in their effort to assert mastery and impose their will. The Portuguese led the way in the evolving transport of captive enslaved people across the Atlantic. Slave factories on the west coast of Africa, like Elmina Castle in Ghana, served as holding pens for enslaved people brought from Africa's interior. In time, other European imperial powers would follow in the footsteps of the Portuguese by constructing similar outposts on the coast of West Africa. The Portuguese traded or sold enslaved people to Spanish, Dutch, and English colonists in the Americas, particularly in South America and the Caribbean, where sugar was a primary export. Thousands of enslaved Africans found themselves growing, harvesting, and processing sugarcane in an arduous routine of physical labor. Enslaved people had to cut the long cane stalks by hand and then bring them to a mill where the cane juice was extracted. They boiled the extracted cane juice down to a brown crystalline sugar, which then had to be cured in special curing houses to have the molasses drained from it. The result was refined sugar, while the leftover molasses could be distilled into rum. Every step was labor-intensive and often dangerous. Las Casas estimated that by 1550, there were 50,000 enslaved people on Hispaniola. However, it is a mistake to assume that during the very early years of European exploration, all Africans came to America as captives. Some were free men who took part in expeditions, for example, serving as conquistadors alongside Cortes in his assault on Tenochtitlan. Nonetheless, African slavery was one of the most tragic outcomes in the emerging Atlantic world. My story. Bartolomé de las Casas on the Mistreatment of Native Peoples Bartolomé de las Casas's A Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies, written in 1542 and published ten years later, detailed for Prince Philip II of Spain how Spanish colonists had been mistreating natives. Into and among these gentle sheep endowed by their maker and creator with all the qualities aforesaid, did creep the Spaniards, who no sooner had knowledge of these people than they became like fierce wolves and tigers and lions who have gone many days without food or nourishment. And no other thing have they done for forty years until this day, and still today see fit to do, but dismember, slay, perturb, afflict, torment, and destroy the Native Americans by all manner of cruelty, 
new and diverse and most singular manners, such as never before seen or read or heard of, some few of which shall be recounted below, and they do this to such a degree that on the island of Hispaniola, of the above three million souls that we once saw, today there be no more than two hundred of those native people remaining. Two principal and general customs have been employed by those, calling themselves Christians, who have passed this way, in extirpating and striking from the face of the earth those suffering nations. The first being unjust, cruel, bloody and tyrannical warfare. The other, after having slain all those who might yearn toward or suspire after or think of freedom, or consider escaping from the torments that they are made to suffer, by which I mean all the native-born lords and adult males, for it is the Spaniards' custom in their wars to allow only young boys and females to live, being to oppress them with the hardest, harshest, and most heinous bondage to which men or beasts might ever be bound into. How might these writings have been used to promote the black legend against Spain? as well as subsequent English exploration and colonization. Commerce in the New World The economic philosophy of mercantilism shaped European perceptions of wealth from the 1500s to the late 1700s. Mercantilism held that only a limited amount of wealth, as measured in gold and silver bullion, existed in the world. In order to gain power, nations had to amass wealth by mining these precious raw materials from their colonial possessions. During the age of European exploration, nations employed conquest, colonization, and trade as ways to increase their share of the bounty of the New World. Mercantilists did not believe in free trade, arguing instead that the nation should control trade to create wealth. In this view, colonies existed to strengthen the colonizing nation. Mercantilists argued against allowing their nations to trade freely with other nations. Spain's mercantilist ideas guided its economic policy. Every year, enslaved laborers or native workers loaded shipments of gold and silver aboard Spanish treasure fleets that sailed from Cuba for Spain. These ships groaned under the sheer weight of bullion for the Spanish had found huge caches of silver and gold in the New World. In South America, for example, Spaniards discovered rich veins of silver ore in the mountain called Potosi and founded a settlement of the same name there. Throughout the 16th century, Potosi was a boomtown, attracting settlers from many nations as well as native people from many different cultures. Colonial Mercantilism which was basically a set of protectionist policies designed to benefit the nation, relied on several factors. Colonies rich in raw materials, cheap labor, colonial loyalty to the home government, and control of the shipping trade. Under this system, the colonies sent their raw materials, harvested by enslaved laborers or native workers, back to their mother country. The mother country, sent back finished materials of all sorts, textiles, tools, clothing. The colonists could purchase these goods only from their mother country. Trade with other countries was forbidden. The 1500s and early 1600s also introduced the process of commodification to the New World. American silver, tobacco, and other items, which were used by native peoples for ritual purposes, became European commodities with a monetary value that could be bought and sold. Before the arrival of the Spanish, for example, the Inca people of the Andes consumed chicha, a corn beer, for ritual purposes only. When the Spanish discovered chicha, they bought and traded for it, turning it into a commodity instead of a ritual substance. Commodification thus recast native economies and spurred the process of early commercial capitalism. New world resources, from plants to animal pelts, held the promise of wealth for European imperial powers. The Columbian Exchange As Europeans traversed the Atlantic, they brought with them plants, animals, and diseases that changed lives and landscapes on both sides of the ocean. These two-way exchanges between the Americas and Europe-Africa are known collectively as the Columbian Exchange. Of all the commodities in the Atlantic world, sugar proved to be the most important. 
Indeed, sugar carried the same economic importance as oil does today. European rivals raced to create sugar plantations in the Americas and fought wars for control of some of the best sugar production areas. Although refined sugar was available in the Old World, Europe's harsher climate made sugarcane difficult to grow, and it was not plentiful. Columbus brought sugar to Hispaniola in 1493, and the new crop was growing there by the end of the 1490s. By the first decades of the 1500s, the Spanish were building sugar mills on the island. Over the next century of colonization, Caribbean islands and most other tropical areas became centers of sugar production. Though of secondary importance to sugar, tobacco achieved great value for Europeans as a cash crop as well. Native peoples had been growing it for medicinal and ritual purposes for centuries before European contact, smoking it in pipes or powdering it to use as snuff. They believed tobacco could improve concentration and enhance wisdom. To some, its use meant achieving an entranced, altered, or divine state, entering a spiritual place. Tobacco was unknown in Europe before 1492, and it carried a negative stigma at first. The early Spanish explorers considered natives' use of tobacco to be proof of their savagery, and because of the fire and smoke produced in the consumption of tobacco, evidence of the devil's sway in the New World. Gradually, however, European colonists became accustomed to and even took up the habit of smoking, and they brought it across the Atlantic. As did the Native Americans, Europeans ascribed medicinal properties to tobacco, claiming that it could cure headaches and skin irritations. Even so, Europeans did not import tobacco in great quantities until the 1590s. At that time, it became the first truly global commodity. English, French, Dutch, Spanish, and Portuguese colonists all grew it for the world market. Native peoples also introduced Europeans to chocolate, made from cacao seeds and used by the Aztec in Mesoamerica as currency. Mesoamerican natives consumed unsweetened chocolate in a drink with chili peppers, vanilla, and a spice called acciote. This chocolate drink, xocolatl, was part of ritual ceremonies like marriage and an everyday item for those who could afford it. Chocolate contains theobromine, a stimulant, which may be why native people believed it brought them closer to the sacred world. Spaniards in the New World considered drinking chocolate a vile practice, one called chocolate the devil's vomit. In time, however, they introduced the beverage to Spain. At first, chocolate was available only in the Spanish court, where the elite mixed it with sugar and other spices. Later, as its availability spread, chocolate gained a reputation as a love potion. The crossing of the Atlantic by plants like cacao and tobacco illustrates the ways in which the discovery of the New World changed the habits and behaviors of Europeans. Europeans changed the New World in turn, not least by bringing Old World animals to the Americas. On his second voyage, Christopher Columbus brought pigs, horses, cows, and chickens to the islands of the Caribbean. Later, explorers followed suit, introducing new animals or reintroducing ones that had died out, like horses. With less vulnerability to disease, these animals often fared better than humans in their new home, thriving both in the wild and in domestication. Europeans encountered New World animals as well. Because European Christians understood the world as a place of warfare between God and Satan, many believed the Americas, which lacked Christianity, were home to the devil and his minions. The exotic, sometimes bizarre appearances and habits of animals in the Americas that were previously unknown to Europeans, such as manatees, sloths, and poisonous snakes, confirmed this association. Over time, however, they began to rely more on observation of the natural world than solely on Scripture. This shift, from seeing the Bible as the source of all received wisdom to trusting observation or empiricism, is one of the major outcomes of the era of early globalization. Travelers between the Americas, Africa, and Europe also included microbes, 
silent, invisible life forms that had profound and devastating consequences. Native peoples had no immunity to diseases from across the Atlantic, to which they had never been exposed. European explorers unwittingly brought with them chickenpox, measles, mumps, and smallpox, which ravaged native peoples despite their attempts to treat the diseases, decimating some populations and wholly destroying others. In eastern North America, some native peoples interpreted death from disease as a hostile act. Some groups, including the Iroquois, engaged in raids or mourning wars, taking enemy prisoners in order to assuage their grief and replace the departed. In a special ritual, the prisoners were re-quickened, assigned the identity of a dead person, and adopted by the bereaved family to take the place of their dead. As the toll from disease rose, mourning wars intensified and expanded. This has been U.S. History from OpenStax. OpenStax textbooks and this free audiobook are covered under a Creative Commons license. The full text is available at www.openstax.org. This project was made possible by CC Echo, the California Consortium for Equitable Change in Hispanic Serving Institutions, Open Education Resources. You can learn more about CC Echo by visiting the link in this episode's show notes. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Instructors can even download a course shell to embed these recordings in Canvas courses. Learn more by visiting www.openaudio.us. Did you find this audiobook helpful? If so, let us know by leaving a comment and sharing this recording with a colleague or a friend.